Hello and welcome to this special edition of Axis Asia. I'm William Hildebrandt. It's a day etched in history, though China still tries to erase any trace of June 4th, 1989, the massacre of pro-democracy protesters at Tiananmen Square. In a moment, we'll speak to one of the leaders of that student movement, Uar Kaishi. Thank you for coming in to you for France 24. And in the run-up to the massacre were weeks of protests. Over one million students and workers occupied Beijing's Tiananmen Square. Calls for higher salaries, better housing, and more freedom. But above all, an end to the dictatorship and something many of the protesters only had a vague notion about, democracy. It was the largest political protest in communist China's history. Uh, Wu Kaishi, thank you for coming in. I want to pleasure. begin by asking you, uh, 30 years on, knowing the outcome of this student movement, how it ended in bloodshed. Would you do it again? Of course not. Then if we have known, uh, we will try our best to avoid And Actually, during the movement, every, every decision the student leader, student organization makes, were very conscious about avoiding uh, confront, direct confrontation, avoiding uh, uh, bloodshed. Uh, so if we have known, if we had known, First of all, the price that we will pay and then what China will become uh, after that will certainly uh, think of a different angle. You managed to escape and still this fight for democracy came at a deep personal cost for you. You're now living in exile in Taiwan and you've been living outside of China longer than you've been living inside of China. I was wondering if you could tell us about the price you've paid for this fight for democracy. Yeah, in 21st century, you would think that ter the term exile has been long, you know, uh, like an infectious disease. It no longer exists. But uh, unfortunately, it does. And most of the exiles uh, today, either from like Dalai Lama from uh, 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 Tibet, the longest uh, uh, living uh, exile. And then I cannot believe I am entering my 30th year of exiling. I, and I thought when I first escaped from China, I thought I'm going back in five maybe 10 years at the longest. Uh, I can report to you honestly, exiling is a, is a, is a mental torture uh, that you, you cannot give up hope, but you have to keep uh, thinking about that. And then I have, a, I am have, I have, a, I have parents that they are no longer, they're not getting younger, they're not getting healthier. And then Chinese government uh, prevent them from coming out too. It's not just me taking the consequences of the past that I have chosen being a dissident, but my, my parents were uh, denied traveling abroad for nothing they did other than they just have this son. Uh, in living in exile, I also have to think about that I am the uh, captain of a sunk ship who, uh, who didn't die. And then uh, the question haunted me all the time that why didn't I die in, in Tiananmen Square? And is there anyone who were there and killed that night because that he or she have heard my speech and that lead them to their deaths? And then the question uh, like that will never really have a, a, an answer, and that, but it will keep haunting me until and, you know, the end. Indeed, survivor's guilt and the questions about never being able to see your family again. And yet you've tried to return to China, what, four times now? That's correct. I am most wanted by the uh, Chinese regime. Uh, you know, by definition, they're supposed to want me. Uh, and then I turned myself four times in Hong Kong, Macau, uh, and then Chinese embassies in the United States and Japan. Uh, they all refused to take me, so I, all of a sudden I become most unwanted. So uh, the irony of that is they know uh, if, if they take me in, um, even in a, in a courtroom, there will be that dialogue that we wanted in 1989. Uh, and in Chinese court, there will be a, you know um, uh, indictment and plea. That will be kind of a, a dialogue, and Chinese government do their best to avoid all dialogue. That's who they are. Yeah. All right. Well, estimates range on the Tiananmen <clears throat> massacre that uh, hundreds or up to 10,000 were killed. That last figure based on a British diplomatic cable. Let's take a look now back at Beijing in 1989. In June 1989, student-led anti-corruption protests had been going on for weeks in Beijing and nationwide. The protesters called for democracy, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech. Anger had been fueled by the death of the pro-reform Communist Party leader, Hu Xiaobang. Students felt his heart attack was due to his forced resignation. 
that prompted them to gather in large numbers. The Goddess of Democracy statue became a central point for them as they occupied Tiananmen Square. Tension built with the students branded anti-party and anti-government. A hunger strike increased support for them. The government turned out to be divided on how to respond. However, hardliners gained the upper hand. Premier Li Peng announced martial law on the 20th of May and mobilized army divisions across the country. Two weeks later, the order was given to use any means to clear Tiananmen Square and areas occupied by protesters. They did so on the 4th of June, a day now associated with one person in particular, a protester nicknamed Tank Man who came to symbolize defiance against authoritarianism. His name is not known. It is not known if he survived. When I see the picture of the man standing in front of the tank, I'm so proud for all Chinese people. It's the most essential way to show the whole world that the Chinese have the spirit of freedom. The death toll 30 years ago is not known though it's put in the hundreds, possibly more. There was a subsequent crackdown on protest. Since June 1989, any political movement taking on the ruling Communist Party has been curbed. The events of Tiananmen are known worldwide, but far less so in China itself. And we're here with Wu Kaishi, one of the student protest leaders from 1989. I'd like to ask you, every anniversary, Beijing scrubs any mention of the Tiananmen protests from social media. Many young people don't even recognize the iconic images, such as Tank Man, for instance. Yes, Chinese government become this control freak on, on all front. Uh, information uh, up, up most. Uh, they control, they put on censor on every words uh, that has remote regard was 1989. For instance, the word 6-4 that uh, in Chinese uh, we, use, we usually use that to uh, refer to June 4th is banned. So imagine, like, in the in on internet, the number 64 is, is a taboo. Uh, so the Chinese government making their best to, remind, to, to erase Tiananmen student movement from history, from people's memory. But they are also uh, reminding people at the same time by conducting uh, the worst human rights abuses within China. They are suppressing rights-defending movements, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, right, human rights lawyers. Uh, they suppress Hong Kong uh, protests. Uh, they threat, uh, t uh, you know, uh, Taiwan. They have they conduct this this very inhumane uh, human rights abuses in in Tibet. Uh, this disregard of 150 some Tibetan uh, have uh, self immolated, and then of course I cannot uh, uh, ignore the one most. Uh, uh, outrageous human rights abuses uh, happening in Xinjiang, my home country. I'm Uyghur myself, and then these days more than a million, maybe up to three million Uyghurs are in concentration camps. We hear different reports, there's no way to actually pin down the number, but we strongly believe it's much, much more than, must be more than a million by this point. Um, so uh, this is outrageous, but where's the world outrage? That's the question. Indeed, yeah. Human Rights Watch is citing the Uyghur internment as well as mass surveillance and the end of presidential term limits uh, as major concerns for human rights abuses in the country. Uh, the government under President Xi Jinping, do you think it would be willing to take the same extreme action that we saw in 1989 to take that action today? I think they have come to the point that they are so confident that they don't have to. In 19, uh, first of all, the 1989 student movement have already established this fear. Uh, it was blood, with tanks, you know, uh, that uh, there are wrong, there are uh, tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of people who took part in 1989 student movement still have a vivid uh, memory of a massacre. And then after that, the surveillance camera, the ever strong presence of the police force, many, many uh, arrests for, the, for any challenge to the government. Basically, government have told Chinese people, you know, uh, follow our way, you're fine. Any resistance, any dissent are not 
tolerant and then will be punished in the most severe way. And that message actually has been carried through. So the com Chinese Communist Party think they don't have to repeat what they did in 1989. Plus, the world have been you know, lying in line to come to Beijing to kowtow for, for trade for the Chinese market. And then, of course, they raise the question of human rights when they go to Beijing under the pressure from their own governments, you know, own, own countries, parliament, NGOs, media. Everybody talk about China's human rights abuses. So when the trade, trade delegation goes to Beijing, they have to raise the question. The only problem is they never wait for an answer. And then they don't use those answers to hold Chinese government accountable. Imagine what kind of message they sent to Beijing. Basically, they're saying, we're going to turn a blind eye on your human rights abuses as long as you gave us the market. That has given China the extreme confidence they have today. Is, is there any chance of an internal change? Uh, some of the middle ranking party officials were said to have been uh, Tiananmen protesters. Any chance of internal change? No, no. Uh, the the world, Western world really need to know what Chinese Communist Party is. Even those members who probably took part in the 1989 student movement, they were in the square. Now they become, they were put, they were selected and uh, took this position to rule the country. And then they are nothing more than a group of bandits taking advantage of that position. Uh, being the ruler of one of the largest economy in the world, to loot that country. So they are nothing more than a bandits. And then no one from that position uh, will be given any room to, uh, to reform, because their uh, mission is simple and clear, to keep the Chinese Communist Party in that position. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We are cashier, a student protest leader in the uh, events we saw back in 1989 in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. That brings us to the end of this special edition of Access Asia. Please stay tuned to France 24.